My name is Willem Rios. I've been attending Second Baptist for 13 years now. In the fall, I will be attending the University of Arkansas. And fun fact about me is yes, I can dunk a basketball on a six foot goal. Over the last four years, I've been able to grow and learn with your students in jump. I've been able to teach them about God and keep them engaged through skits. I played Longbeard in, in Bart Underwood. And my personal favorite, Master Achoo. What's up? I've been on fire for the last four years and serving has become one of my greatest passions, but I was not always like this. My name is Willem Rios, and today I will walk you through how I went from total complacency to giving my life to serve Christ with all that I have. See, I was very fortunate to be born in a home where both of my parents saw a relationship with Christ as the absolute most important thing you could do in your life. You see, I was born in a Christ-driven home, but because I was so young, I really didn't understand the importance of that. Now, I'd show up to church on a Sunday and sit through jump watching the, the team members dance and do their skits and sing and, tr and trick us into thinking there was monsters in the candy box, but that was really the extent of my involvement. You see, it wasn't until I was in fourth grade that I had an actual desire to learn. I was sitting in the car next to my older brother on the way to church when I saw him crying about the crucifixion of Christ. And that had confused me because I had never felt something like that when it came to something church related. So in order to understand that, me being me, I decided I would read the Bible cover to cover. Now, I had read the Bible and I had acquired that knowledge, but I quickly mistook that biblical knowledge for an intimate relationship with Christ and I fell into severe complacency and I let myself live like that for several years. You know, I would show up to church on a Sunday and flex with those churchy Bible answers that every youth group leader loves to hear and then the following day do virtually nothing to grow my faith. See, I wasn't like a bad kid, you know? I was just hanging out, I was just chilling. I was your non-problematic average dude. And that's the thing about complacency is, looking in from the outside, you can never really tell. You can never really tell the validity of someone's faith without knowing their heart, and only God can definitively know that. And the other thing about complacency is, if no one knows you're hurting, no one can help fix you. At the peak of my complacency though, I had a dream. And like, this wasn't one of those normal dreams where you just kind of wake up and forget about it. This was one of those really vivid dreams that like you wake up and you remember every single detail. And the dream, I was in the car with my family and we were going over the bridge, it goes over 290 and a uh, guy comes on the radio. <laughs> Russia's declared war on the United States. There's an intercontinental ballistic missile coming straight for Cypress, Texas. You have 13 seconds to live. <laughs> now. Thinking about it now, that dream is kind of ridiculous, but you know, you're never really thinking that when you're in a dream, you kind of just take everything for fact, but again, thinking about it now, like, are you kidding me? That guy's bedside manner was horrible. <laughs> you have 13 seconds to live. <laughs> also, like, if there was 13 seconds to live, like, you know they found out longer than that, but they just decided to wait until there was only 13 seconds left. Anyways, in my dream, I see my family begin to pray and say their goodbyes, and I wanna join them, but once I go down to pray, I begin to consciously doubt what I was praying to. Do I believe in a God? Do I believe that these prayers are going to be answered? If I were to die right now, what's gonna happen to me? There was an intense heat and a bright light that took over the car and in an instant, I was sitting in my bed wide awake, mortified. Over the next following months, I had one of the worst existential crises of my entire life and I was hurting and I was scared. But I didn't want anybody to know, so I put on this facade of confidence and acted like there was nothing wrong. You see, my problem was, was that when I was younger, I had put no investment into my faith. So obviously when you have a relationship like that, it's gonna crumple easily with no contestment as soon as a problem comes in. My problem was, is that I hadn't studied a faith that I claimed as my own and I hadn't put any investment into it. So my freshman year, I decided to do that investment. And let me tell you guys, the stuff I found there's thousands of eyewitness accounts of Jesus performing his miracles and hundreds of eyewitness accounts of him coming back to life and walking the earth after his resurrection. There's scrolls that were found in the 90s that confirm the accuracy of the Old Testament word for word in Hebrew. This information was more than enough to re-spark my faith and rekindle the relationship I was lacking when I was younger. And it opened my eyes to what my parents had tried to teach me so many times before. Today we were asked to represent a name of God and the importance of that name in relation to our story and I chose the name El Salai, or God My Rock, because what I found to be the most detrimental thing in my early walk was not having a solid foundation to expand upon. You see, in Matthew chapter seven, verse 24 through 27, 
Jesus gives the parable of the wise and the foolish builder. In the parable, Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You see, when I was younger, I had put no investment into my faith, and there was no foundation for me to expand upon. I had utilized nothing God had given me, and I fell into severe complacency. But once I had opened my eyes to what God had to teach me, I had so much more happiness to give. I was so joyous, and I was so excited to just live, and I wanted to share that. So my freshman year, I decided to join the jump team and just give my heart to those kids to teach them something that I had been lacking my entire life. And I would do skits, I would sing, I would dance, I would just look dumb for the kids, and I enjoyed it. I still do. But like I said earlier, from fourth grade to my freshman year in high school, I didn't grow an ounce in my faith. Why? Because I was complacent. I was comfortable where I was, and I felt like the knowledge I had acquired in fourth grade was more than enough to keep the, my relationship afloat and to keep my faith steady. And I could not have been more wrong. That's why I've made fighting complacency a personal battle for me. So I ask you guys today, are you living life the way I was? You know, it's funny, we'll spend our entire lives learning a profession to make money, but we won't even put any investment into a relationship we claim determines our eternal salvation. So again, I ask you today, are you living life the same way I was? When you pray, are you confident in what you're praying to? If you die, are you confident in where you're going? Is your faith in Christ and in Christ alone? Thank you. My name is Molly Prunty and I've been attending Second for almost two years. Next year, I will be taking classes at Lone Star. And one fun fact about me is that I have lived in five different states. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines adoption as the act of taking by choice into a relationship. In August of 2001, my parents adopted me from China, and I am one of 10 adopted children. Yep, 10 children. <laughs> that definition defines a significant part of my story and my family story. Not only did God adopt me into his family, but he has always been there for me. If my mom and dad had not followed God's calling to adopt, then my siblings and I would have never heard the name Jesus. When I was little, I loved going to Sunday school, learning new Bible stories, and singing songs in church. But I was always shy and afraid of leaving my comfort zone. One of the first memories I had of this was only being able to make it two weeks in preschool and then having to be taken out because I couldn't handle being away from my home or my parents. This began a battle in my life of constantly fighting fear. When I was four years old, I accepted the Lord one night on my bedroom floor. I remember praying and talking and asking my mom questions about Jesus. She gladly answered all of my questions and led me through the gospel. That night, I knew that Jesus was the missing piece in my life, so I gave my heart to him. After that night, I thought my life was going to be flawless, but as I got older, my struggle with fear continued. My mom and I started praying and asked God to help me. And as God began to help me, he gave me a servant's heart and a love for adventure. That led me to go on my very first missions trip to Haiti. When I came back from Haiti, my heart broke for those people, but I knew that I wanted to continue to go around the world to serve other people. Even though God had been giving me a new love for serving his people and was helping me grow, my struggles lingered and I had a difficult time making friends. My family moved about every three to five years because of my dad's job. Moving, going to different schools, and going to different churches made it much more difficult to connect and have solid relationships. My family lived in Massachusetts for five years, and in those years, I made great friends and I was finally comfortable with where I lived. Then in eighth grade, my family moved to Tennessee and away from all of my close friends. I felt like God was taking something away from me. I had finally gotten to a point to where I was happy and comfortable with where I lived. 
That move led me to become angry and depressed. My mom told my grandpa about the things I was going through, and he sent me an email to encourage me. He told me, be patient and be a good friend, and someday God will make you a blessing. Someday, when you get older, you will be able to help kids who are lonely because you will understand how they feel. Even though his letter encouraged me at the time, I did not know the impact his letter would have on my life until much later. About a month after receiving that letter, my grandpa passed away from cancer. My grandpa was a man who dedicated his life serving the Lord and sharing the gospel. When he died, I did not know why God would take his life and not heal him. As I went through high school, I was the most lonely I had ever been. I felt alone and I thought that I was insignificant. I told God how alone I was, but I did not think he was listening, so I stopped praying. Once I stopped praying, I thought I was fine and that I could handle things on my own. But that led me to become numb, both spiritually and emotionally. Then one day, I went to youth group, and everyone was in their own friend group except for me. In that moment, I realized how alone I was. I suddenly became very anxious, and all the emotions of fear and loneliness came back. I thought, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. Everyone's in their own group except for me. I came home that night and broke down in my room. I began praying and asked, God, why did you make my family move? Why am I so lonely? Why couldn't you heal my grandpa? Maybe there's someone in this room who has either felt or feels completely isolated. Maybe you were questioning God's sovereignty or his faithfulness. I know how that feels, so let me encourage you with a few verses that God has placed on my heart that have been such a blessing and a great reminder to me. Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13 says, Then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That moment of vulnerability and being real with God about my thoughts completely changed my outlook on this situation, and I believe he could change it for you too. One day, for no reason, I was digging through my drawer and I found that email from my grandpa, which I had printed. I began to read the letter over and over. What he said about God using me to help others who are lonely stuck out and pierced right through me. I knew right then that God gave me a purpose and that he can use my struggles to help other people. When I was younger, I would have never thought that God would use someone like me, a shy, insecure person, God called someone like me, who at one time was too afraid to leave our own home, to go on multiple missions trips and to love and serve his people. God continues to give me the strength and the courage to do things I thought would be impossible for me to do. This year, I am taking a speech and debate class. I went into the class thinking that I would not have the confidence or the ability to get up and speak in front of people. However, I know that God placed me in that class for a reason to prepare me to stand before you today so that I can tell you how incredible he is. I don't know, let's see. My life is not perfect, and it will never be perfect. And Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Even when I felt like God wasn't there and my prayers weren't being heard, I can now look back and see that God was always there and each of my prayers have been answered according to his plan. That is why God is my Yahweh Shammah, which means the Lord is there. God has always been there for me, even when things got messy and when I gave up on him. And God will always be there with you too. I know that God has always been there for me because God gave parents to an orphan baby in China he blessed me with a loving family and lots of siblings. And he used my grandpa with the letter that he wrote to me many years later to help me understand God's plan for my life. My life is not perfect and it will never be perfect. But I know that God is there to give me hope and peace whenever I encounter any obstacle. And God will never place any obstacle in your life or put you through anything that is too big for him to conquer. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know 
that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God allows us to struggle for our benefit and for his glory. Right now, you might be going through something that you think is going to crush you. Hold on. God is there, and he's just starting to use you. My name is Riley McDaniel. I've been going to Second for about five years. I plan on attending Blinn College in the fall. And a fun fact about me is that I can also dunk a basketball on a six and a half goal. Have you ever tried really hard to get invited to something and it just didn't work? Because for me, this is sad, but it happened all the time in my childhood. Like I would hear about somebody's birthday party in the days leading up to it, I'd butter up that birthday boy so much. I'd go above and beyond to make sure I got that invite and I was at that party. So a few days would go by, the invites start going out, I'm real excited, checking the mail, big smile on my face until I realized, didn't get one. And then I'll kind of have this moment where I'm like, hmm, mistake. One, I look dumb putting myself out there just to get this invite. Two, I didn't even get this invite. Like, this was tragic, devastating, really. Like, biggest letdown of the year when I did not get an invite to this party. And I think the reason is because when I was younger, my goal was to get invited to everything. And I think the reason behind that is because oftentimes, I thought the world and the people in it had what I needed when all I really needed was Christ. So as we start this morning, I just wanna ask you, is your satisfaction coming from the world or the people around you, or are you looking to God to provide? My name is Riley McDaniel, and this is my story. See, I grew up in a strong Christian based household that was constantly up at the church. Every type of activity held, you bet that the McDaniels were there. But even though I was raised in this environment so much, my faith really wasn't my own. And what I mean by that is, I thought since my family were all strong believers, I would kind of just tag along and get a fast pass straight into heaven. I didn't really grasp the whole concept of a relationship with Christ being specific to me. I, I mean, I accepted Jesus into my heart at a young age, but it wasn't meaningful. I wanted to do what I wanted to do and then kind of put Jesus on the shelf for later. So I stayed at this super basic level of understanding of barely knowing anything for a super long time it was no big deal. And since my roots weren't developed in Christ, I tried to get my acceptance from whoever seemed to be living the good life at the time. And in middle school, this was a group that was made up of about 20 kids who I'm convinced have been besties since birth. Like their moms were best friends, so they grew up best friends, that sort of thing. And everyone in the school knew that they were the cool kids. And they walked with swag, dressed in style, talked in slang. They acted like the spotlight was on them all the time, which it was and I needed to be in that group. I thought, if I was in this group, my life would be made. Popularity status, social status, everything, right? So when they decided that they were gonna try out for the basketball team and play basketball for the team, basketball just became my new favorite sport. I was like, I'm totally gonna make this team, I'm gonna be a part of their group, I'm gonna be a cool kid, right? But even when I was a part of the team, it still didn't feel like I was enough. So I went further into the process of trying to change who I once was and to what I thought that they would like. And I wasn't blind to it either. I could see I was acting like a whole different person. I would act one way with my parents or at church, but around them, I was cool, Riley. Put the shades on, the cool Riley. And it's weird how in that moment, all I wanted was to be their friend. I didn't care what I had to give up as long as I was in the group. And it's because all my attention was being placed on them that my faith in God was really just paused. What I was doing was looking to them instead of looking to him, God Almighty. So the summer of freshman year is when things started to change. My youth pastor at the time gave a message on how my relationship with God should, should almost be like a best friend. And he asked, if you only talk to your best friend once a week, or when you need something, are y'all really best friends? And he went on explaining how because of what he did, we should want to develop that relationship. And let me tell y'all, the amount of conviction that I felt from that lesson right there was ridiculous. I felt convicted because for the past couple years, I've only cared about me and what I wanted, what I thought I needed. Christ wasn't the priority. It was just getting accepted into that friend group. I thought I needed that. 
But Jesus showed me I only needed him. So the message sparked a fire within me to seek him with everything that I had. And it wasn't long before he replied, but I just chose not to listen. He made it clear that those friends that I was seeking after were not in, in his plan for me. He just wanted all of me, and I just wanted all of what they had to offer. So he kept knocking, and he kept knocking with that same message, and it got to the point where I couldn't ignore the knocking anymore, so I stepped back, I opened the door and said, Lord, let's just do it your way, because I'm exhausted and burnt out doing it mine. See, the truth is in our lives, the more that we try and impress people, the more it will leave us unsatisfied. We have to stop trying to seek acceptance through other people, but know that we are accepted by God through Jesus Christ. It's Jesus plus nothing that equals everything. In Proverbs 8.35, it says, whoever finds me finds life, and the favor of the Lord is with them. Meaning there is no other source of life except through God. There's nothing we could possibly add in or substitute to make our lives better than having that real personal relationship with Jesus. Why are we trying to find our way to fit in with the culture when the almighty, all-loving, supreme God created us to be set apart? He made us all unique with different gifts and personalities and passions, yet it's all to make him famous. And at this point, I just wasn't doing that. So after the message, I tried to live differently. But if I'm being honest with y'all, it was really hard. Harder than I imagined because after a while, I just felt lonely. My loneliness made me question God, saying, God, why do I feel like this if I'm doing what you've asked of me? God, why can't you give me friends right now? God, why can't you tell me what's in your plan next? And for the next five months, my mom and I would get together every night and we would pray that God would supply people in my life that would speak truth and be Jesus loving. Yes, it was hard. Yes, I was isolated for a while, but in the end, it was completely worth it. It's like it says in Ephesians 3.20, God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. He did this in my life. He's done so much more than what I could have ever planned or imagined on my own. And I began to see this the following summer. Because the following summer is when Beach Retreat was coming around. The famous one, the famous one, right? Beach Retreat. Everybody talks about it. I didn't know anyone, but I decided I would go because I looked online, y'all. Those Yelp reviews were so good. I'm kidding. But really, I felt like something was calling me and I should go, right? So I went and at the beginning of the week, I knew nobody there, not a single person. And at the end of the week, I left with some of the best friends of my entire life. And I truly believe it's because my mom and I prayed that God would supply. And I know now that his timing was perfect because it was, it was when I shifted my focus from the popular kids at school to God, that's when he provided more than just those friends, but life changers who showed me what it's like to have a Christ-centered lifestyle. See, the theme this morning is it's all in the name. The name I chose to describe God is Jehovah Jireh. And when translated, it means the Lord will provide. God will provide all that we need when we just run to him. So let's stop seeking acceptance through the culture or whatever it may be that will keep us chasing and instead sprint to God's love because he truly is all that we need. It even says in Philippians 4 verse 19, and my God will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Meaning there's no other way that those needs will be met except through Christ and Christ alone. So my final question for you this morning is are you trying to fill your life with things other than God? Maybe you're looking for acceptance other than his, or maybe it's wealth that you feel you need, or happiness in the people around you. Maybe you're like me, striving as hard as you can for something that honestly doesn't even matter. My point is, Jesus Christ is all that we need. Thank you. My name is Ariana Gale. I've attended second for four years now. This fall, I will be attending Texas A&M University. And fun fact about me, I was nominated on The Voice in 2010 until I woke up. There's a profound beauty in every written story. I've come to admire that as we read, we never really know what comes next. We simply turn the page and absorb the author's written words. I've seen God, the author of my story, constantly dare me to turn the next page. 
despite not knowing what he's written. However, in the chapters that he's already revealed to me, I know it is a well thought out story, immersed in unceasing love for me, the reader. My name is Ariana and I'm excited to share some of my favorite pages of God's story in my life. I grew up in Sugarland, Texas and was the oldest of four girls. For those of you who are wondering, of course, we always got along. Yeah, no. My biggest aspirations at this time included being on Disney Channel, convincing my mom I needed a puppy, and obviously owning all things sparkly. I gave my life to Christ when I was seven years old during a lesson that spoke about God's unconditional love for me. In that moment, the Holy Spirit captivated my heart and when asked if anyone would like to receive this love, I mustered up the courage to raise my hand. I was given a certificate that symbolized my new citizenship in God's kingdom. When my mom picked me up after the adult service ended, I remember showing off that certificate and proudly proclaiming that I had accepted Jesus in my heart. She gave me the biggest congratulatory hug and told me that she was so proud of me. Now making mama proud is always a win in my book. It is the most rewarding feeling when I can put a smile on my mom's face and know that she, more than anyone else, wants to see me be the best version of myself. So that next week when we went back to church, I was excited to announce that I had accepted Jesus in my heart for the second time. <laughs> Y'all, I thought I was on a roll. I obviously was not greeted with the same triumph because I know now that accepting Jesus only needs to be done once and it should be done for yourself and not for others, not even for mama. At this time, I understood that God was real, but I still didn't grasp what he was capable of or willing to do for me. However, these were my first glimpses of God's presence in my life, drawing me close. This would be one of the many pages of God's love story to me. Although I had faith in God as a child, it wasn't until middle school where I found myself in full surrender to his plans for my life. My home life harbored hostility and uncertainty because of my parents' failing marriage. My father was a very difficult person to love. He was not the selfless hero that most daughters envisioned their dads to be. Instead, he was inconsistent and easily angered, which led to a lot of fighting and brokenness within my home. Eventually, my parents got a divorce, leaving me extremely bitter that I didn't have the perfect and complete household I felt entitled to. I remember isolating myself most days and dwelling in frustration. My methods of venting consisted of incoherent grumbling and enraged prayers to God. I wanted him to know that I was disappointed in his lack of restoration and healing. I would challenge God to prove that he was still good because obviously I was being overlooked. After months of wrestling with God, I found that my only option was to trust him. After all, how was I supposed to understand his plan if I wasn't willing to listen? I realize now that God had a perfect plan of healing on the way, but it would be on his time. I had to take the back seat and trust God in my season of waiting. A few years later, my mom remarried Sean, my stepdad, which then prompted our move to Cyprus. Now this began another long series of infuriated prayers to God. I had to move schools, leave my friends, and then adjust to being in a new family. I loathed this transition, and I made sure it was evident. I would often think, if only I could just change it. In reality, I was crying out for control because clearly God was not abiding by my request. I soon came to realize that God does not act according to my wants, and I desperately needed to put aside my agenda in order to fulfill his own. With moving to Cyprus came finding a church with my new blended family. We got involved with Second Baptist, which became God's vessel of delivering peace and reassurance into my life. God gave me intentional and encouraging youth pastors, leaders, and friends who poured into me and my walk with the Lord. God repainted my vision of what a family should be like and how a man should treat his wife and children. My stepdad has been such a blessing in my life and has loved and instructed me in more ways than he probably knows. I currently have a beautiful and extraordinary family that has helped shape me into the young, Christ-seeking woman I am today. But most importantly, God has begun to reveal himself to me in all the many different pages of his love story. This is why I can call him Jehovah Rapha. The Lord is my healer. I've seen God make beauty from ashes in my life and I believe that he can do it 
and yours too. I'm reminded of David's words in Psalm 40, verses one through three. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. There was a period of my life where I doubted God would ever show up. I thought I would just have to settle for the anger, for the brokenness, and for his silence. Four years later, I know that God was mending every broken piece and using it to build the firm foundation that I will eternally find refuge and rest in. I know that there are people in this room that may feel as if God's goodness and healing has been exhausted by their circumstance. I want to encourage you today that God is writing your next page. He is the perfect author, writing the most beautiful story personal to you. God yearns to have every broken piece because he knows that it is only his love that can bring a perfect mending. Because of this, we can forever proclaim Psalm 40, verse 16. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. As I began to understand God's timing and sovereignty in my life, my angry prayers of resentment transformed into thankfulness and submission to the one who is greater than myself. I learned that despite not understanding the circumstances, God's presence still reigns over every passing moment. This should give us confidence to find peace in the waiting because ultimately it is in the waiting where we can learn to fall in love with who Christ is. My question for you today is, do you come broken? Jesus, with arms open wide, has a supernatural healing ready for you right now. My healer has restored me and will continue to use me for his kingdom. His love story in my life is still being written and I turn each page with blessed assurance. Thank you.